for people and children with dyspraxia or DCD, um, it's it's something that in general um, research has shown even um, on your D's most recent article shows that the general um, self-image and their experience of success can be slightly limited compared to um, the general public at times and that's due to a number of different aspects that we kind of touch as we go through um, and that it's also really important that we look at from a strengths-based approach that it's not always a case of saying oh this is hard for you that is hard for you but like I'm yet to meet a person or a child of Spax or DC who hasn't astounded me with their strengths or their gifts and talents so um, it doesn't even need that much looking, but it's just really important that we take that strength-based approach. Um, and looking at mental health and health, it's with like mental health is considered one of those key components of health up there with your physical health, your um, gut health, um, your <clears throat> general well-being and health, all those pieces. I think it's important, especially for younger people, that they appreciate it's part of your health. I know myself, excuse me, as um, as well as many other people I know, look at mental health as something that doesn't need to be touched until it's something that's a problem. But it's really important, just like our physical fitness or our, our um, health. If we if we go for a run, we go for a walk, we go, we take some vitamins. We we're preventative and we're preemptive about it. And it's important that we do things for mental health as well. That we look at say, what's going to make me happy? What's going to cheer me up in times when you're feeling good too? To keep that level as well. Um, and it's kind of Sharon kind of touched on there, the whole COVID-19 experience over the last 18 months um, has been very different. And I suppose I know I've talked to a number of children um, with Straxidus who enjoyed those breaks and things like that. But it's also really important to look at the kind of social social pieces and stuff like that. But also the break in routine and the structure that was lost um, and the control that can have that detrimental effect. Um, I suppose for young children in particular, those in those early years, particularly primary school, the socialization and those social learning, the interaction with their peers is a massive part of their personal development and reaching those milestones. milestones. Um, and also that things like turn taking, things like um, things like playing games, things like make, just making mistakes with friends and those social play and those things are really important for development are all things that um, might have changed. And then social media, I suppose, particularly looking at um, things like TikTok has grown massively um, and Instagram would, would have been there before. But it's just looking at it. I've met to see people on, on TikTok or Instagram just chilling out, doing the normal thing. There's always those big, amazing things making their lives look amazing. But for young people, they see that so often and they see what's amazing. Um, but they don't see the other side of things that people are normal as well. Um, and get these aspirational ideas to have a perfect life and when their life isn't perfect they're nearly um, having, getting anxious about it or there's a negative feeling towards it. Um, so there's something even there that I said is the, uh, the emotional first aid kit is something that's just kind of relate, linked throughout to that and it's something that just makes it physical and you can like something there just kind of putting a bit of a, more of a structure on the feelings that um, may be ex ex expected there. Um, so I suppose looking at DCD and dyspraxia and opportunities for success, um, my, my own background in teaching, um, like realistically, you go to a parent teacher meeting and you often hear, oh, your child's doing well because they're, they're either doing well academically or their writing's neat. And that's something that a lot of children um, with dyspraxia, particularly the neat writing, um, have difficulty with, um, or even the pace of writing. And then you're saying like, the product of what they're creating might be at exactly the same level or even above other ch the children who are getting praised, but because the organizational piece isn't there, they're considered that they're not succeeding. So maybe a step back needs to be looked at there. And I suppose the one thing that I always say um, is that research shows that children and people with dyspraxia are average to above average intelligence. But the research also shows that children with dyspraxia and people with dyspraxia have less positive experiences of education which from my point of view says there's an issue or um, a concern in that education piece that needs to be changed. Um, looking at the opportunities for success then in the home, things like that, like the daily activities, your, your act activities throughout the day, your ADL activities of daily living. Uh, um, <clears throat> they may be behind their peers in certain aspects. Um, look, looking at um, hobbies, what hobbies they engage with. In Ireland, we're, we're, we're starting to change a bit better change bit more but like in the past it was if you're not good at hurling football soccer dancing or speech and drama you weren't you like you were you weren't doing well whereas like it's really important that um, i say it at the bottom there and i highlight it find your niche and um, things like rugby swimming um like we look at activity in a bit more detail towards the end of it but looking at your hobbies that works for you it doesn't have to be what everyone else is doing 
um, and things are opening up again, which there are those opportunities. I suppose social situations, particularly in the younger children, that social learning, that um, children with maybe um, proprioceptive needs may find it maybe a small bit rougher or children with difficulty following rules of games may find themselves excluded. Um, and they're just looking at this one little article there says that self-perception can often be um, can be um, less than their peers for children with dyspraxia ECD as a result of all these things. It's to no fault of their own. It's just a case that we need to look at and say, how can we promote these strengths that the children have throughout these areas as opposed to looking at what the norm for, is expected, which isn't this, which isn't right at all. So um, when we look at first is what builds positive mental health, what are the areas we want to look at. And I say the first first thing I'd always look at is connections with others and social time. And that's something that probably in the last 18 months has been definitely changed, if not lessened dramatically. Um, with connections and being connected as part of things, we don't like I know for many young children they mightn't appreciate school, but it's something that creates with them as part of the community, their teams or their hobbies and things like that, and meeting up. Um, excuse me, they may lost that connection. And then looking at their social time, if so that's been greatly reduced. And if not, it's been adapted to kind of a media, kind of looking at the screen as you're here tonight. Um, I think your self-image and how you see yourself um, or how even in some cases, how you don't see yourself, that you don't look at yourself negatively, that you don't see the problems, that you're just happy being who you are. As you kind of touched on already, an understanding of mental health, appreciating it's a part of us, it's part of everyone. And that even the most confident and um, outgoing person on the surface that ha will have those doubts as well um, I think perceived control is a huge thing um, and it's not necessarily being in control of all the aspects in your life but just more of a case of feeling that there's a routine in my day I know I'm going to do this I, I, I'm in control of getting up in the morning going to have a bite to eat going to school and that routine can be really helpful whereas the last few months it might could, has been changed a lot and for some children that change in structure can be helpful but in general, that, that feeling of control, even if it's not, and, and I suppose control is a very broad term there. It's not a case of having everything straight and structured all the time, but it's just fee, having that feeling. So for me, it might be a case of I feel in control when I know that my when my lunch is ready in the fridge in the morning. For another person, it might be a case that they need to have everything sorted through their day and listed um, and just being aware of that as well. Problem solving is something huge. And I don't mean that in a case of going down and doing Sudokus or um, solving riddles. Problem solving to me is much more the ability to look at a situation and say, um, okay, this is the problem now. This is what's wrong. What can I do and how am I going to do it? And we look at that a little bit more, both in the growth mindset and um, a short, short while about the um, co-op approach. But it's important to look and say that whole ability to say this isn't a dead end. It's not a fixed situation. There's room for that growth and movement. Self-management and regulation, I suppose that's huge um, and we kind of focus on it for younger people tonight, but in reality, we all know an adult who has difficulty with these areas. Um, and we're looking at, say, the ability to say, basically be a good winner and a good loser or and not be a bad loser or a bad winner in situations, to not be gloating or not be, or not be getting over emotional about tough situations and having that regulation piece. And we look at it in a, in a bigger picture in a little while. Um, Something else that's huge would be exercise, and I think something that's really underrated. Um, and I don't mean, I suppose, I, 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 in reality, I should say activity there. I'm going to focus on activity a little bit. But when I say exercise, something as simple as 30 minutes walking five days a week dramatically decreases the chances of both either developing depression or dra dramatically decrease the impact of depression on a person. So it doesn't have to be getting up and doing five gym sessions or following Joe Wakes religiously, but it's just a case of being active. And again, we'll look at the activity in a, in a bit more detail later on. Um, mindfulness, again, and being in the present is can be really um, positive. And again, we'll go touch on that in a bit more detail. So I'm going to skim through these now. And that kind of comes into the bracket of slowing down there as well. Um, kind of just stopping. And I think that's the one positive that we could all nearly agree on, that that's time to slow down during the last 18 months and take stock and look at how things are going and maybe say, we don't have to be out every Saturday night or we don't have to go to every single training session that's available or we don't have to always be doing something. Um, giving and selflessness, and I suppose that's something that schools wouldn't necessarily get the credit that wouldn't even be observed for what they're doing. And like there's lots of charity and things like that, but also the opportunity to help other people. Um, and I know a lot of people would have gotten involved in different activities, which is brilliant. 
but it's something that's shown, and I know I've seen another article that say it shows that the endorphins, the biological experience you get from buying something for yourself online, which I'm sure we've all done in the last short while, is the 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 endorphins you receive from that versus buying someone from else. So if you bought a gift for someone else, the endorphins you get from that are much higher. So again, there's science to show it. Um, learning new skills in games, and um, just and I think that's really looking at not stagnating, not staying in one position. You're looking at um, everyone who's here tonight is looking to do something new, to learn a little bit, to try and change and improve. And that's a great sign when looking at that. I think um, the next two then, being heard and having an open, positive environments are really important. Just the ability to feel that you have someone to talk to, you can talk things out and that you're being listened to as well, which is really important. So um, when we just a quick note on, how I, how I feel that OT and, DC, and DCD and mental health all come together is that from an OT perspective, we really look at the person. And um, I think that's really important in with dyspraxia because no two people are the same, no matter how similar they may seem on paper, they're very different experiences. And um, we look at things from a practical point of view. And again, you look at this stuff is broken down to, to basics and move forward. It's not going to be, it's, it would be very easy for anyone who wants to implement any of the ideas and, and strategies to implement them. And I think it's really important then with Sprax DC is breaking things down to their smallest parts. So looking at um, instead of starting and saying a grand big idea like mental health, throughout this we look at the individual components. Um, and we look at the person as a whole, we look at them in their, in their school setting, in their home, and um, with their friends, we look at their strengths, their challenges, um, and what they feel versus all the family and things like that. So there's all those pieces are included. And I think that's really important when looking at it from this point of view. As I mentioned already, the co-op approach, it's an approach that I'm sure many of you are familiar with already, but for anyone that's not, it's, an, um, it's a method developed by occupational therapists in Canada um, for working with children with, um, with, um, with certain difficulties, but it's one of which is dyspraxia or DCD. And it looks at um, the goal plan do check, um, which is basically a structured format of um, setting goals, planning how you're going to do it and checking. It's strengths-based focus. It looks at strategies and plans as opposed to, it looks at this is how you can work around a problem and instead of saying, this is how you do this one task. So again, it, it develops really good skills and it's all about positive and moving forward. And I think that's kind of what will be the message throughout tonight is that it's about being positive, being open to new things and keep moving forward. Even if it's a case of um, it's quite difficult, um, just looking at how we can, do step one. It doesn't have to be step all the way to step 10 and be finished. It's looking at step one and moving forward from that. So um, when we look at those, we focus and we look at through the just right challenge. The just right challenge is basically trying to achieve that gray area between success, between being really easy, being really easy task and being able to do it. Um, being really easy to complete the task versus not being challenged at all and finding that area where your child is challenged they're experiencing success because they're doing well through it but also um experiencing also having a challenge and they're developing and improving um, and i suppose that's really important that differentiation of task and what we can do to help someone or what someone themselves can do is look at how much help you're getting with it looking at breaking up the task into chunks uh, excuse me start with your easiest bit first i know i'd say that always Take an easy starting point, get that done. So you're on step one. You're not at step zero struggling to get to step two, jump to step two. You're at step one and move forward. Um, and I think something that really comes to mind with this is the idea of failing. Um, so for me, your fa failing is your first attempt at learning. And it puts your look, and I don't I would have said it's really it's great. Failing is okay. We we can not succeed at things as long as you're learning. What, what I what I what I found was that it's really important that we look at failing and say, okay, what are they learning? So if you're giving something and getting the child to do the same thing over and over again, or, the, or you're doing the same thing over and again and getting nowhere, that's not learning. You're not progressing, you're stagnating, and you're definitely getting more frustrated and definitely um, not, your, your self-esteem or your self-image definitely is, is going down. So it's really important to look at what's the impact of that failure. If it's a one-stop task and it's not working out, um, and you go and you learn from that and you do it better next time. That's, to that's a totally reasonable um, idea to be moving forward from. But if you're accumulatively failing and you see that completing this task is associated with failure, that's a very different experience. 
Um, I have a short video clip there from Meet the Robinsons, but I think I'll just keep going because it's such, it's such a lovely night and it's about a two-minute clip, but if you get the chance um, afterwards to look it up, and essentially it looks at the boy makes, sorry now for the spoiler, but the boy makes an invention, it doesn't work. And he's very upset, but the attitude is, this is brilliant, you fail because you're going to learn from this and move forward. It's, um, I think that's real important. As long as it's moving forward, failure is okay. But we have to monitor that, um, that um, accumulative failure aspect. And if there is a case of accumulative failure, you might need to go back, go back a step, go back to the previous step before it and move forward from then so that your experience of success and enjoying it. Because we all know ourselves, if you're constantly not doing well um, at the same thing and knocking your head against the wall, you're not going to enjoy it, you're not going to improve and you're probably going to move away from it. So we need to, like, that's where the problem solving comes in. We pivot away from that and move forward. So then what I think really comes next from that is this whole idea of the growth mindset. So I think the easiest way to describe a growth mindset is to describe the opposite first, which is a fixed mindset. The fixed mindset is one that's fixed in that current moment of time of the negativity. I can't do it. I'm not good at this. This is too hard. I'm never getting that. This doesn't make any sense. And that we've all had those feelings. And it's okay to have those feelings. They're very normal and very reasonable feelings. But what changes those feelings all of a shot is the use of the word yet. So if you're saying, I can't do this, and you put the little word yet at the end of it, all of a sudden, I can't do this yet. When I say the word yet, you're saying, I can't do it now. Why can't I do it? What needs to change? And where am I going to start? And you're looking and saying, one, there's potential. It's no longer, I can't do this. I am bad at this. This is a problem. Negativity. It's all of a sudden looking and saying, I can't do this yet. So is there something that I can change? Is there something I can change in the task? Is there something someone else can do to change it for me? And we look at that. Um, it's problem solving. So as soon as you say yes, you automatically start saying, if I can't do it yet, what's going to change to be able to do it in the future? And it's open to an opportunity. I think that's a really foundational piece of kind of that positive moving forward. Um, and again, it's looking at developing a skill or an, a mentality. I think um, looking here, um, I think one of the things that is really important to look at when developing a growth mindset or moving towards it is your ability to look at feedback. Um, and here it says, oh, feedback is constructive. And then the other one says feedback is personal. And that's, a, and I think that's really an obvious indicator of some people where their mindset's at at that current stage. But at the same time, if you keep getting negative feedback, it doesn't mean you've got a fixed, fixed mindset. It might just mean you're, you're getting um, teed off about the fact that you get, keep getting negative feedback. And that's reasonable too. But I think when you look at those two, you look and say, um, challenges help me to grow. You're looking at saying things that are difficult are helping me. And that's really positive. But with your fixed mindset, it's stuck in that one moment. I'm not good at this. I don't get it. It doesn't work. Um, and I think there was one particular young man that I worked with before um, while working with Dyspraxia Ireland. And I think he, for he was a young man, but with much, much wisdom, he said he said that he he could do anything. It would just take him a little more time than someone else. And I think that summed it up perfectly. Um, and I think there's a little phrase in Latin, out invenium vium opacium. Um, and that basically says, if I can't find a way, I'll make one. So if things aren't working out, going the way someone else told me to do it, I'm going to go and find my way and it will work in my way and we'll get there. It doesn't have to happen today, tomorrow, or next year, but we'll get there. And I think that really sums up that growth mindset piece. When looking at a concern, be it something to do with self-esteem, be it something to do with um, a, ta a task that I'm finding difficult, when looking at um, something that's happening externally, it's something might be with another person, I break it down into what, where and how. So what is the concern? What actually is the concern, both as a global thing and what's the actual main, the, the core of that concern? Where is the concern coming from? So what's the source or what is the, if it, be it external, something happening outside the person or is it internal? Is it a thought process or a consideration? And how can I help with this concern? So I'd always go, what's your dream world situation? How can you fix it if you had everything you could ever want? And what can I do now and bring it back to that? Um, I think that fits in when we're looking at concern so for example um be it um something that's difficult um with say towards mental health or something that's happening in the world around i'd always bring it back to okay if we want to help someone with a concern be it something to do with confidence or something to do with their ability to do a task um or something with their interactions with people and we're telling them oh you need to be really positive cheer up work forward all this stuff 
and you're saying you just need to do this and you say you might say oh yeah <clears throat> it's a challenge and we move forward but i think it's really important that children especially younger children know who they are themselves as a person so a lot of us as adults don't really know and we spend much of our lives looking towards who we are as people we very rarely stop and reflect and say try and break it down and something i'd always do as a first step um, would be a personal profile with children and say what are your interests what are your strengths what are your challenges who are your friends um what 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 skills have you got what are your goals and i love with the goals that always go and throw out a big dream one what's the one if you could do anything climb mount Everest, go to the moon whatever and then also try and have two maybe two maybe real realistic goals that would be more attainable in the short term and i get to go through this and it, no doubt the first time you do it it's going to probably be a bit of a challenge and you probably need a lot of coaxing and say for example i worked with one particular child with dyspraxia who told me that they're no good at art and when you stop and think, what is art? It's a medium of expression. So um, in my eyes, if someone said you're no good at art, it means the person doesn't understand what art is or what your art is. So I spoke to the boy and said, what actually do you have difficulty with? And he said, oh, I can't. I find it really hard to draw the pictures the teacher draws. And then for me, that's transcription. That's copying. That's fair enough, a part, drawing a part of art. But definitely doesn't mean he's not good at art. And I spoke to him for a little bit and he said, and he said oh, but don't you do comics? Yeah, and aren't they really good? Yeah. And do you do drawing in that? Yeah. And I was like, is that not art? And it kind of a switch clicked in his head and said, yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, it was no longer a case of I'm bad at art, just massive general topic. It was one particular area, which was a challenge, and that's okay. And if he really wants to work on that, he can. But it was a case of much more positive look out. There's a part of art I'm really good at. It's just not what's done in school all the time. And again, looking back at that and saying what's done in school can often have that negative impact um, because that's what's the norm to have that done in school. But there's so many other areas. And I think it's really important that we sometimes challenge those areas or help our children to understand that they can challenge those areas in their head. Um, and say that just because, say, my handwriting isn't really neat doesn't make my story any less of a brilliant story. And I think I'd always start and say, the child does it with themselves and we might repeat it again. But then I'd also ask, what does your teacher think of you? Or what do you think your teacher would say about you? Five words, give me five words what your teacher would say about you. Give me five words that your friends might say about you and give me five words that your family might say about you. And if very often a child might not be able to say the things they want about themselves, but they might say their friend would say, I'm a really good friend, I'm kind, I'm caring, but they wouldn't necessarily have those in their strengths. So it just you know, adds another layer to their thought process or their self-awareness. I think that's really important to start. That's your starting point. Who, who is that person? Who is that child? What are their positives? And move forward from that. And it's also a really good one to just kind of get 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 your child thinking and get to know if there's something new in their life, maybe their new interests or things like that, those kind of aspects. Or even for yourself, if you're doing it and you're looking where you want to start, go oh, and you'll be surprised how many strengths you have um, compared to the challenges. Maybe you might write down more challenges, but over time, and I'd say this, I would say about this is it's a living document or a fluid document. The first time you do it doesn't mean you can't rub it out and one or two and add in and move on. And I think as you go, you'll find there's a lot more strengths than um, challenges now i think as i said earlier self-regulation the zones of regulation isn't something that's specifically for young children or young people it's something that I, we all know an adult who could definitely do with a little bit it's i find this is a really good tool and um, because for helping understand emotions so when you look at the first piece of self-awareness you're looking at who they are as a person when you get to the next level it's helping manage emotions um, and, you know, say here we're looking at on the left side, there's some emojis probably more suited to um, early teen to the, the just the words, which is probably a, a mid teens, late teens, adult. But you can also adapt them. I know I've, I've, they're really easy to, to make up. I've done Disney ones. I've done Stranger Things, Star Wars. I've done Frozen, all these different aspects. You can just really easily um, to make the personalize them really. And what this essentially does is it breaks it kind of puts a framework around emotions. I suppose the first thing you really need to look at is, does do you or do your, does your child, if you're talking about that, no, understand their own emotions? Do they have, um, do they appreciate that when they have that pit in their stomach and something not nice is happening, that's anxious or fear? Or is it just something that they don't really, can't really put a grasp on? Or that when something new is happening around them that they get, or that things are really busy, that they start tightening up, but they just think that's what happens. Um, so I think the first step is really help making sure that they understand those emotions. And the second step then is you're looking at um, 
what's the stimulus for each? So you establish that the blue area is your low zone, the green area is your good, your really focused zone. Your yellows are getting a bit jittery, moving away, and your reds are losing control with an emotion, be it anger, fear, or, or um, sadness, or whatever it is for that child. And again, the child will pick those emotions that they might feel, and you can give them a lot of scaffolding with that, and that's okay. Um, but I think the next one then you're looking at so is how you feel in those emotions, but then how to avoid and maintain. So you want to maintain the green one as much as possible, and you want to avoid the blue, yellow, and red. Um, and I think it's really important that the child, even if it's really simple stuff for the first one, or you're doing it yourself, um, I think the first one need, needs to be done coming up with their own answer. Maybe they need a little bit of help and guidance how to refine it. That's totally fine. But the point of this activity isn't for your child to be able to stop and do these emotions now. It's to develop a skill that they know that when they get really annoyed or that when they get really down or sad or anything happens, that they have something they go to. So, for example, when you're sad, it might be a case of, you take out your favorite book and you have a real page that. When you're green, it might be a case of um, when, you're re when you're really focused, you make sure to check in and say, well done to yourself. When you're getting a little bit hyper, it might be a case of you need to stop and take a deep breath. When you're in the red zone, you might need to remove yourself from the situation. All those kind of things. And, you're, and what's really important is you're problem solving um, and you're taking ownership. So now it's their strategies. It's no longer us telling someone what to do you or that or your child is taking ownership over that and developing strategies and skills um, i think this is a really nice um sample of something to do and um, to help with that self-regulation both for young people and adults and um, i think it works really nicely down from your most um physical and concrete senses to your more abstract to focus the brain so when you're in that really high um stimulated um area of thought and you're getting those emotions are really strong you start with your eyes, so you, you take three breaths. So again, you bring down the, the heart rate straight away. You look for five things. So really easy, no matter what stage you are, to pick five things you can see. Then you go four things you can feel. So now you have to start the thought process and move your hand or touch or see how your skin's feeling. Then you need to stop and hear. If you're listening, if you're hearing or listening, what you need to do, stop making noise. So all of a sudden the noise is going down as well. You're listening or more a finer sense. And then you go two things you can smell. If I ask you to find two things you can smell now, you're not going to find two things straight away. So you're going to have to take a couple of seconds and it's a much more fine smell. And I really like the last one is list something you like to taste. So there's more 99% of people won't have anything in their mouth at that stage. And you're looking at something you, you, you would like to taste. So you're thinking you have to stop, go from the concrete all the way to the abstract of something that's not even there. And then you take three breaths after you find that. So you've gone from a really high level of arousal. You started to funnel in with physical senses all the way down through to um, a really abstract sense. And then you reground with three little breaths. Um, I think something else that's quite nice is something that um, here we can see is the stop method. And this is more of kind of just a check in. This would be something when you're in your green area, maybe, or you're just starting on the blue, yellow, you might say stop and just take a pause. No matter what you're doing, stop and just take a deep breath in. And follow your breath through your body and bring you back to that current moment. You're no longer stressed about the max. You're no longer worried about um, you're no longer worried about learning those spellings. Just focus on now how you're feeling. Maybe there's a bit of tension in the legs, the back, maybe a bit sore, maybe a bit your heart rate's going really fast, maybe your breathing's going really quickly. And just acknowledge what's happening for good or bad. And then you go back to what you're doing. So just a check-in. You stop, move in from all these things going through your head and just check in. I think that's really another nice little piece that goes in with that self-regulation. Um, and touching base. So I suppose that there was the start of um, kind of that mindfulness piece. Um, and for anyone who's a skeptic, don't worry. Um, before I went back to college as a mature student, I too would have been a skeptic of mindfulness. Um, but with the stress of work um, and all those pieces, it became a really important part of my life. And it's something that I wouldn't, um, wouldn't take out of my life. It's a really important part of my life and my routine. I think it's not it's not a case of sitting with your fingers in a peace sign, trying to meditate or levitate off the ground like you might see in, in the movies. It's just about paying attention to what's happening in the present. And I think there's a lovely picture there on the right that sums it up nicely. And we go and we look, it's not, it's not, there's a case of having a, a mind that is full, as you can see with the man on the left, is thinking about what happened yesterday, thinking what's happening tomorrow. He's nowhere near what's actually the lovely walk he's on. Whereas being mindful is just, it's not a case of being empty minded. It's been focused on what's happening in front of him. You can see the little girls looking and enjoying being there um, walking through. 
practicing mindfulness involves breathing, guided imagery and practices. And um, it's just a case of bringing down that, bring, focusing in that moment in time, bringing down the heart level. And I think three key parts are intention. So wanting to take part, attention, just focusing on it for that moment in time and your attitude. So being not judgmental, being curious and kind, and just being kind to yourself as well, not saying making a fool of yourself or anyone else. Um, and I think, I think a really nice starting point for mindfulness, it's not going to your um, videos and your songs and whatnot. It's, um, I think it's something is gratitude. And it's just three things we're thankful for. Um, and if you just stop and just thought about it, it's counting your blessings and saying it could be as simple as I'm, I'm able to get up in the morning myself and get out of bed and walk. I have food on my table every day, something as simple as that. It can be much more um, personal. It can be much more specific to you. It can be about a person in your life. It can be about a particular task you have. It's about something else. And I try and keep away from the monetary things. I don't look at money or tickets or things like that. But really just things that you're really blessed to have and that if everything else was gone in the morning, I would, you'd still have these things. Um, I, think it's, I think I find the start of the day, it works well, but the end of the day works really well. Just before bed, just before I either um, put on um, something on TV, Probably not the best thing would be putting on something on the TV, but even just before I take out a book or before um, they do uh, maybe a mindfulness routine, just my gratitude and three things. And it's a nice little starting point for anyone who's a skeptic. Um, the next stage there, I would say, it would be um, mindful breathing. Um, I think a really nice starting point would be hand or finger breathing. If anyone wants to do it with me while I demonstrate, um, I hope you'll um, notice a small difference. So again, just taking one hand, and we just, as we go up the finger, we'll breathe in. As we go down, we'll breathe out. As we go up, we'll breathe in. As we go down, we'll breathe out. As we go up, we'll breathe in. As we go down, we'll breathe out. As we go up, we'll breathe in. As we go down, we'll breathe out. As we go up, we'll breathe in. As we go down, we'll breathe out. And you can do both hands. You can do it twice over. I even find myself, when I'm doing these webinars, I find it really ground, grounds me back. Um, and relax me in the middle of something where I'm talking um, quite quickly and it slows me down. But it's something that's really good and I think it's really helpful, particularly for children who don't want to be seen as different. It's something that can be done discreetly with a hand under the table. I find that different people like different sense, senses. I like a nice soft sense as I go up and down the hand. Some people like a much rougher sense, maybe a, a, a coarser brush. Um, bubble breathing, if you have a very young child, in which they have um, a bubble wand and it helps control the breathing. For some children, it might be quite difficult to actually acknowledge the muscles in your stomach flow through. Um, and along those lines, there'll be belly breathing. And belly breathing is breathing deep from the stomach. And for older children, you might be able to just talk about, talk through this. But for younger children, you may need a, a prop or an object. In the picture on the left, there's a rubber duck, a bean bag, or something colorful, just so you can see the, the stomach rise and fall with the breathing. Um, no, another tool might be flower breathing, in which you go around the petals of the flower breathing in and out, and you can either use a paper version or um, a flower version, a real version, uh, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, dot to dot breathing, the one on the bottom there is an optical illusion, but it's um, something simple like those dot to dot books breathing in as you go one line out to the next, or you can find that's a nice little worksheet there, or something like a guided meditation, which we'll look at in the next slide. Um, so. Looking at stretching as well, so just the release of the muscles, and this can be really beneficial, particularly yoga. Um, I think yoga is brilliant because we, I would have thought yoga is stretching and rolling around the ground, but once you actually engage in the practice of it, you're there's a lot of gross motor, excuse me, fine motor work and um, balance coordination pieces that are done in a really safe environment, but um, can be really beneficial for a child with dyspraxia obesity, and something I would highly recommend. If balance is a real concern for your child, something along the lines of starting with chair yoga, which is a seated stretch and um, controlling your breathing and going through um, things like hand warm ups, um, in which you can just go through different that for a large piece of writing. Even, and I'd often bring in animals like the butting goats or um, I'd say itsy bitsy spider or um, slithering snake. Just the hands warmed up, but you can incorporate breathing into that or um, make maybe less. Um, arousing animals or less arousing um, items that may be more suited and I think there if a body scan a top to bottom stretch and I personally find that works really well and I know I've done it with a number of different children I found it a lot better than say the visualizing of the um, guided imagery where you just stretch through the body and you sat at the top you need to sit in your head and stretch your um, jaw out uh, um, or, your, or clench your teeth things like that or I prefer to start at the feet and work up and go through like ankles back 
um, stretch the calves, and then roll the ankles, stretch out the ankle bones, moving up to the quads, um, all the way up through the body, and just feeling your body and really grounding yourself in that moment. And if you go on YouTube or um, Spotify, you might find really good for your body scans and just keep them short. You can get 20, 30 minutes of it and build up to that. Sure, if that's if you're really enjoying it, but I'd say start five to 10 minutes is enough for your first trial. And um, you don't want to be losing interest and thinking this is rubbish after only two or three goals when maybe a two or three minute one would be perfect to start off with. Um, this is something that I, I kind of touched on already is just activity. So exercise is brilliant for mental health because it releases endorphins, um, it increases blood flow, it gives a time for the brain to shut off. But exercise doesn't have to be running or cycling or playing sport. Activity is what I really would like to focus on. It's not just exercise, something as simple as gardening, something as simple as walking, yoga, doing the cleaning. If that's your business, do the cleaning. Clean the house from top to bottom, hoover 10 times over. That's activity if you enjoy it. DIY, maybe it's a bit of woodwork, maybe it's just doing a bit of the, the cutting the grass or fixing a fence. If that's what works well for you, if it gets you up and out of a chair, away from a screen, um, and that's the way to go. The weather is fantastic at the moment, um, long way at last, um, but it's just about getting up and getting out. It's not a case of having to, and if sometimes the weather might let you get out, um, there's no reason why you can't figure out something to do in the house or maybe even just get an umbrella and go and go for a walk or whatever it's going to be. Make, and try and make sure it's something you enjoy, not something that you feel that you have to do. And I'd say just try everything um, and build up. Don't try and do a 5K run day one. There's, um, have I, have I, next, I think I have a little bit more coming up. But there's things like f couch to 5K are brilliant taps to get you started. Um, and I have another slide in a couple of minutes. Just go through more reasonable versions of activity. Um, and kind of the, one of the main functions of activity would be to be a brain break. So that's just giving your brain a chance to stop constantly thinking. We live in such quick and fast environments that, say, um, looking at a computer screen or looking at a phone is not actually a break for your brain. It's nearly hot wiring your brain with the blue light coming from these devices that tells your brain it's morning time, gives you the serotonin, because it, um, sorry, serotonin, the morning hormones that make, make your brain think it's morning time, and you're wide awake at 11 o'clock at night and still scrolling. But it's important that we give your brain a break. We go and we look at physical things like walking, nature walks, warm-ups, mindfulness, we kind of looked at distraction breaks, things that just literally just take your brain, your, um, brain away from what you're doing. So um, as we talk about active and movement breaks, you get these online classes like lovely Joe Wicks there, he wouldn't be my personal favorite, but he's just an easy one to go to if you want to start off with. Um, you can get really, if you just Google um, programs for things like skipping, press-ups, um, couch to 5K. Um, and again, it's looking at when you start skipping, it might just be a case of 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. And if you have a structured program, it can be a lot easier to start. For press-ups, again, the more horizontal you are, the easier. So if you want to start with a wall press-up, do it. It's more, it's more exercise than not doing it. And then stick, go to the stairs or your or a wall in the house and start getting a bit more, a bit, sorry, start vertically, get a bit more horizontal. So start leaning into it. And that's a bit more pressure, but it's not. And you're building it up. Um, and then you get, maybe someday you get to the horizontal and you start on your knees. And then you do it while you're on your knees. And then you get the knees out. So again, it's building up. And that's what we say. Step one is so important. It's not step 99 or step 100. That's the important one. It's step one. As I always say, the hardest part of going for a run is getting your shorts and your shoes on. Once they're on, you're 99% you're, you're certain to go outside the door. And even if it's only around the block, you're doing it. But once you have that step one done, you're on to the right track at least. Um, Busy Breaks is a nice program by the Irish Heart Foundation. They just have some nice activities and stretches. Something as simple as a walk. You either have a purpose, like going to get something, or just a casual, literally walk. Even on evenings like this, it's lovely to see the animals and the children up and about. Um, dance. There's nothing that says you can't just do a dance activity. I know there's loads of TikTok. Um, TikTok dances and stuff that... Um, I know my niece has gone mad for. Um, and it's all about finding your niche. It's like, um, I, when, when I grew up, it was a case of you played hurling football or soccer, and that was kind of your activity. And, and there was no running the roads, it's a bit of a lunatic who ran, ran around the place. It must be a fitness freak. These things have gone a bit more um, open minded now, but it's all about finding what works for you. Um, I'm still finding what works for me, and it changes very regularly. And uh, I'd say my main hobbies would have changed. Every, nearly every year or two years over the last 10 years. But find what works for you at that moment in your life or that moment in time. 
maybe a walking group with someone might work well maybe the couch to 5k where you can try on your headphones works well maybe it's the cycling that suits you and you just never got got, got up and get going um, and just about finding that niche and just giving things a go i think that's again as i said step one trying these things is just the really important one um don't be afraid to give yourself a distraction break um i think that's something that's really important particularly when studying that you give yourself i'm doing half an hour um and then i'm stopping for five ten minutes to just do maybe crosswords do something like that or sudoku if maybe it's a case of paired reading reading with a younger brother older sister or an older brother older sister younger brother younger sister maybe the individual time away from everyone else reading Maybe it's a bit of art and craft, maybe a little project you're constantly going five, ten minutes of that. Maybe it's a bit of writing, just actually just word vomit onto a page and just getting it down there. Um, maybe it's a bit of music or singing, maybe you just want to put on your headphones. I know it for myself. And I like when I want to de-stress my brain, I put on really loud music and I find that works really well when my heart rate's high in the middle of the day and I need to just de-stress. Um, and then later in the day, either um, a soft, I find um soft melodic music generally classic music or even i find white noise works really well and i think like um i think my personal favorite is rain on a tent works really well for me at night but again you find there's loads of apps you'll get free apps that have that white noise available or even something simple like those silly games you all played when we were younger hangman 20 questions little card games things like that and um, I suppose one thing that we probably forget an awful lot about when we talk about children is life balance. We always hear about adults talking about, oh yeah, I need to find my life balance um, and have a bit of leisure time for myself. What we look at for adults will be self-care, productivity and leisure, which means your self-care is looking after yourself, your exercise, your diet, your personal hygiene um, and those kind of activities. Your productivity is what gives your day meaning. So it can be housework, it can be your actual work job, it might be your um, you know, helping someone else, maybe doing a bit of homework with someone. And then your leisure is your downtime. And I think it's really important that we make sure that we have those three areas, that our productivity isn't our leisure all the time. And I, I'm, I'm a devil for it. I know I won't rest until I have my work done. So that so then generally I need to have time. Productivity nearly works as leisure at times, but it's important that I also have that time that's set off, that it's after this time I'm doing nothing but watching TV or going for my walk or my run or whatever it's going to be. When we look at children then, we look at themselves, their education and their play. And then for that teenage years, it kind of blends between the two. But it's just important that we take take count and take stock that children have very busy lives too. They're often going from place to place, and particularly for, for any, any of you of children doing exams at the moment, it could be just get up, study, school, exams, home, study, and there's no balance in that. Um, which, and I know that might be might be the way that they have to do it for those couple of weeks, but to make sure that either they get a little bit of exercise activity or a bit of leisure, or that once the exams are done, that there is that return to some bit of balance i think it's important that we look at screen time and we say that we try and restrict that as much as possible and there are apps that can turn off um screens and that but just and it's and i suppose it's important as well that we practice what we preach if we're trying to get a child or someone's telling us to turn off our screens and they're they're on their screens beside us it's not necessarily going to work so it probably needs to be a bit more bit of buy-in and um, there's a lot of extracurriculars available now and trying to find and it's great that we're trying lots of things we're making sure that we have um time for ourselves that we're not going 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 and that leisure isn't an act, active pursuit we're constantly going to be on leisure time i suppose looking at this as well it's not more zoom you're here listening to me on zoom uh, it's not exactly um it's, it's not exactly easy going all the time to listen to someone talking for this length of time but it's something that will drain we know for young people who are doing lessons and things like that it can be quite difficult as i mentioned already social media has an effect um if, if i was to really focus on two things um for for mental health one is exercise or activity and two would be sleep or sleep hygiene if i was to narrow it down and just give you a 30 um, a two minute talk it'd be one on activity two on sleep hygiene see um and just so you know for sleep hygiene i'm just care i'm sure most of you know already i'm just clarifying so i didn't know this until a few years ago sleep hygiene does not mean clean in your bed it's about um being in a position to to, to be able to sleep well um that was something i got very confused with up until recently um bedtime routine and times so it's important that there's a routine before bed that it's not a case of right you've watched that really exciting cartoon now it's time for your bed and um, there's a slow down routine that's go get brush your desk maybe it's get your pajamas put them on brush your teeth go to bed one story um depending on their age it might be a case of right 
go to bed for 10 minutes, go up there, listen to music, and then your lights out. And it'll depend on the age of the child and looking at that that way. Um, and it's important that they relax prior to sleep. That I know myself, I'm very bad for times just working until nine o'clock and then stopping um, and saying, okay, I have half an hour, I'm just going to pray my dinner and then go to bed. Uh, and that's not, there needs to be that gap between probably an hour to two hours would really be, would be really the best buffer at least. Foods and drinks that you're looking at, low sugar, low caffeine, um, chocolate, coffee, and those kind of things are better off being left earlier in the day, not late at night. Cheese, which is more down to the fact it can cause um, dreams um, because the casein in cheese and dairy products can, basically it's a slow acting protein, so it's still being digested throughout the night. Um, and that might be really helpful if you were doing, um, if you had did exercise in the morning and needed to refuel, but it's not really helpful at night if your body's working over time to digest it. Um, I think it's important to remember beds are for sleeping, that we're not doing, uh, we're not playing our video games, we're not doing, um, that we're not reading our books all the time, that we're not doing our makeup or whatever it is in the bed, that that bed is specifically for sleeping. And of course, we have our lazy Sunday mornings, and that's totally reasonable, but as a general rule, we try and make sure that the, our bedrooms conducive to sleep, that's cool, which isn't necessarily easy these nights, but it's quiet as quiet as possible, it's comfortable, and there's low lighting, um, and avoid that. And I say, avoid the clock. It's important that the clock is for the alarm in the morning or for telling us what time it is when we wake up. It's not for checking throughout the night. Um, I used I used to have one of those projector alarm clocks on my roof. So I thought it was brilliant. I know the time the whole time, but I was waking up at three in the morning, looking up and realizing it was three in the morning uh, because it was there shining down on me. So try and use only the clock for the alarm. The alarm clock is that. Um, and then I have reviewing lists or sequences. And it's just a case of looking at maybe um, having, if, you, if you're if you forgetting lots of thoughts in your sleep and things like that, waking up, but have a little notebook beside you and just write them down, I guarantee you. I call that the washing machine when your thoughts go round and round in circles at three in the morning. Um, but when they're written down and you look in the next morning, you'll probably laugh at yourself and say, those thoughts are not important. They were just annoying me at that hour because it was the middle of the night. So again, this goes really important for sleep. It's um, I have here is just the recommended number of hours for children um, and all ages, really. Um, but it improves, it improves ability to take on learning. It improves recovery. It improves medical health. It improves um, ability to maintain weight. All these pieces are affected by sleep. Um, and I suppose for most of us here, it's probably going to be that um, 13 to 8 hours, 8 to 13 hours, depending on age. And that should be a minimum requisite and um, I know for myself I'm I'm seven minimum or else it, the day is over really so um, I think it's really important to get that to be functioning as well as possible and it's the last thing I think there before we look at the um before we look at our um links and things I think the environments are, are really important we look at our physical environment and we look at we try and slow down particularly towards the end of the day but there's a quiet time in our day the time is either just tuned out be it white noise or just be it in a quiet place and that there's low stimulus. It's not always go, go, go throughout the day, that there is those environments, that there is those opportunities. I know we all live busy lives. And I'm sure if you, um, not families have, that, have many people in the household, just trying to make sure there are those times. Maybe it's a family choice, maybe that the lights are turned down a little bit after eight o'clock, um, or maybe that the, um, there's not as much going on, things like that. I think your interactions are really important in the environment. I think, I think for us as adults, it's really important, but for you young people as well, it's important that we look and say our interactions between adult to adult is really important because we scaffold for the children. For children between their peers, it's really important because they're um, because they're learning um, and developing respect and that kind of at that peer level. And then also with yourself, how you we all have that self talk. And I don't mean having full blown conversations, but how we look at ourselves. I think it's really important that that's a positive interaction with ourselves, and we start and we look look towards ourselves in that positive light, and we move forward from that. There's a number of apps there and links which are to do with um, most of them are to do with meditation um, and the last and there's another app on the next page which is just to turn off devices. There's the CAMS link there which is the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service links and there's some lovely, um, lovely links on that and also I know on LinkedIn the American CAMS have some really good resources as well and I'm sure they have something on Instagram as well I just haven't looked at it. There's, low, there, there, there's a nice 10 mindfulness exercise for, ch for children and through those there's lots of different ideas for mindfulness 
Twinkle there is a teacher resource website that's very good, but it's a fee paying. Um, but they have lots of nice resources to do with that kind of self-regulation, self-management, those pieces. The OT Toolbox is um, an OT website that has um, that has lots of freebies. So don't bother going towards the paid section aim for your freebies and there's some nice resources. There is, um, some, and then there's just some other websites there with different links. So it's like bang on, just going on to eight o'clock there. Um, I will stay on for questions and, and comments, so don't worry about that. Thanks a million for your time and paying attention. I suppose the main thing for anyone that needs to log off now, make sure to get your own mindfulness time in, get out, enjoy the weather while you can, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Stephen. Oh my gosh, there's a wealth of information in there. I think uh, people will be looking back on each and every slide and getting something from each of them. Certainly the, uh, the power of yes really struck a chord with me. I think that's so important. And I really hope that a lot of families start using that. It's a very, as you say, it's a very, very simple but impactful way of bringing your child around to your know, progress and, and let's keep moving. Um, I have a few questions for you and I do understand that some people might need to go, but uh, if you would like to listen to the questions, please do. The, uh, there's a, a theme that's running through a few of them and it's in relation to children who can be their own worst critic in a way. Mm. So a lot of the time they put a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, there's a child who lashes out when you know, he has an accident or, or falls and then shuts down. Um, there's another child who, who really you, sort of doesn't, uh, doesn't open up when he's finding things difficult to, uh, to try, you know, new tasks or something a little bit different. Um, and then there's the child who's really hard on himself and you know, feels he has to get everything right and it has to be perfect. So how would you, what advice would you give parents facing those situations? Um, I suppose um, when looking at the child, that's, when you look at a child who says that they have to have everything perfect and right, I think as parents, I, I'm not personally a parent, I won't claim to be a psychologist, but for adults, we often look at children if we're working with them, remind them, we always feel that we need to be this perfect role model. And I think something that's really important for us is to be able to show children that we're not infallible, we're not perfect as a step one and say that we have plenty areas that we need to work on um, ourselves. And I don't mean going into deep analytical for ourselves, but more a case of that I'm not, I personally know I'm not very good at writing. And that's something, handwriting, and that's something I always share with children or any patient that I'm working with and say, yeah, it, it, don't worry about that. And I think it's really important to kind of, when I come back around to what I was saying earlier about that self-awareness piece, and it, like just to start there and work forward with that self-regulation, it was just building those strategies towards it as step one. Um, and I think it's that's probably going to be a day or two's task. That's okay. But at least you have that to move back towards. But then it's kind of when you're talking about the child who is getting angry or lashing out, I think they're looking at maybe looking at a strategy to say um, what happens when you get to that level. So I suppose you're also looking at the, are you kind of just really focused on mental health and looking at that thought process? But for children with dyspraxia or DCD, there's also going to be the sensory processing. There's also going to be... Um, a number of different potential um, uh, neurodiverse concerns. So you're looking at those maybe and looking at your specific child and saying, is it a case of that he's getting really tired because he ha has to sit all day straight up in that chair and then all of a sudden he's fatigued and exhausted when he doesn't feel he's done a whole pile or maybe she is, um, or maybe she is having difficulty because the lighting's going and there's another aspect. So I think it's really kind of trying to narrow it down to what is triggering it. And then I suppose looking towards the idea of maybe things like social stories and board games to help um, with that idea of turn taking um, and, and not necessarily failure, but not always winning um, and moving towards that. And there's some really fabulous um, board games and things like that that would look towards that kind of not always being perfect, but it's okay to not always win too. Yeah, yeah, very good advice. Um, so for a teenager who doesn't want to get out of their comfort zone, who's, you know, who doesn't want to try new things, but then frequently when they do try them, they enjoy them, but it's always a struggle to get them to try. And I, I know motivation is a big thing for a lot of us as well at, at different times. But what advice would you have to um, the parent of a teenager who's trying to get them out there and, and try different things? Um, I suppose it's kind of a case of looking at 
Um, the main reason I know myself personally, I wouldn't want to engage something. It would be a fear of failure. It's a fear of either not doing well at that task or the pe- not getting on with the people. And it builds and it builds. Um, I suppose one thing I know a number of parents have spoken to do things like maybe karate where they're doing and it's the adults involved as well. So it's the case of you're saying, I'm, I'm really nervous about this too. I'm going to do it with a lot of people younger than me. But we're going to do it together and we're going to figure it out as we go. And if that's not practical in your case, it might be a case of something as simple as getting them up and, okay, they don't want to do hurling, they don't want to do rugby, but we're going to go for a walk in the evening twice a week. And that's non-negotiable, okay? It's, we'll get up and you're being active. So I know myself, um, I'll hold my hands up and say I let myself go over Christmas and my fitness went to pot. But I started walking, got up to 5, 10k a day and it was no problem because it was so gradual. It wasn't just stressing me. It wasn't tough going. But I, I learned to, to love it. And I think it's really important when you do an activity like that, that at the end you say what you got from it, that like you say, my head feels so much better. Um, and then the next step, once you've done, once walking's okay, maybe then you move on to the something a bit more sociable, maybe two or three children in it, a smaller group activity. And then you're moving to that bigger, really, really um, scary 15 person sport where there's 30 children at the training session or there's 20 people in that room doing that dance activity. And it needs to be, graduated and built up I suppose would be the best advice I could give for that. Great yep I think that's that's very sound advice. Um, so social interactions let's talk about social interactions again always a difficult time for teenagers you know de- developing new new uh, peer relationships and social interactions so what advice would you give to a parent who's trying to support their 13 year old to develop new friend groups and get more active socially? Perfect um, I suppose like it's we're blessed and we're, and we're cursed in some ways that the, the site we live in the moment is very social media driven. But um, I know from even working with, I remember doing a group with when I was working with Spraxley Ireland and I had like three children. And it's like, okay, what do we have in common? Trying to be a social group or whatever. The three children were playing video games with each other the whole time already. It's a case of trying to, I know the Spraxley Ireland is brilliant for the different groups and support groups where children and parents can come together. But it's, it's also important to like, I, I don't have dyspraxia or DCD. I know X amount, but I will never know what it's like to have it. I can do as much research as I want, but it's the children who know each other are the ones that are going to be really good support networks. But I think it's also important to look at different areas that can be done online, different similar um, hobbies and stuff. Because maybe 20 years ago, if you had a specific interest, you were very restricted in who else your friendship groups could be. But now there's um, those much broader groups that are available and I suppose looking at trying to make match their needs to those social groups as well, as opposed to saying, oh, John's the same as age as you next door. You, you should be friends. That's not necessarily going to work. It's really helpful to have a friend that's close by and develop those close friendships. But I think it's also important that we use what resources are available to us and also look at our child as a person, not just as an entity that needs friends. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, sorry, I know I'm flying through the questions here, but I have a couple more for you, Stephen. That's fine. No um, here's a, quite a specific one. Have you any advice for a 10 year old boy who has recently reverted to making a big fuss about dressing? Um, takes far too long, struggled with this when he was six or seven and they used parents used a timer um, and has been doing a lot better for a few years. But recently it's becoming more challenging again. Um, should they revert back to the timer or because he's a bit older now, should they try something different? Um, I suppose the first step that I'm looking at when you're mentioning that is saying, what is the difficulty? Is it a case of it's the physical putting on the clothes? Is it the selecting of the clothes? Is it manipulating the clothes and getting them on? Or is it a case of that when they they can get all the clothes on, but they just don't sit right? Um, I'll start with the easiest one. If they're getting the clothes on, it's not sitting right. I suppose the first step is you're creating um, a self-check. So a mirror in the room where they can look and see themselves. And even if they're still not right, it's step one. Step two is them looking and say, and then you're going to you ask them and say, what's wrong? Step three is then they're able to self-assess. But I suppose like you're talking, when you're saying 10 years old, no, they're still quite young, but that is just that kind of starting really moving towards that um, puberty fear, um, stage in their lives. And you're looking at, they're much more self-aware of who they are as a person and they are changing. So I suppose you're looking at, I think it's really important to figure out what is the problem. Is it is it that they have difficulty putting on the clothes or is it an organizational executive functioning piece? If it's just a case that they have difficulty putting on the clothes, a new strategy, um, I think, or are looking at that, looking towards maybe 
a way of doing it that suits your child and figuring that way out. If it's more of an executive functioning piece, you might be looking back to maybe something along the lines of the co-op approach and breaking it down to the really micro parts and saying, this is how we do it. Um, I know, what was the app? Um, Adobe Spark is a fabulous app that's like, um, it's really, it's a bit, for want of a better description, it's an, uh, an interactive PowerPoint. So it's basically, you can put videos, you can put clip art, you can post pictures and whatever, and you can put music even if you want, and you do it step by step. And I find it works really well with children doing those kind of ADL tasks or new, or re repetitive learning, say like something I, I've done before would have been brushing teeth. But it's, you go through the step by step and they have an app on their phone. They look and say, what's step one? Okay, my socks, how am I doing that? Maybe there's an explanation. Step two, and I'd always say, also say, do it systematically, feet up or head down mm -hmm. so nothing's missed. I suppose that's probably um, best advice we give there. Yeah, that's very sound advice. Thanks, Jude. Um, another very specific one. Um, Seven-year-old son received negative comments on end-of-year school report. Comments were, does the bare minimum and does not always apply himself. Uh, he received very low marks for writing and PE. Should the parent share this report with him? Their gut instinct is not to. Um. Okay, I suppose your first question you ask yourself is, do you honestly think that's a fair reflection of your child? And I think I think 100% of us who would say no, that I think does the bare minimum is a relatively unfair comment to say about any person. Um, and maybe they, maybe they, they just, like, and it's, again, it's a very fixed mindset statement to make without saying it could feel, could do better if attempted more. That's a really, that's a bit of, that's actually a bit of process of thought saying, Maybe they're afraid of not doing not doing more and things like that. I I don't think your child needs to see that written down, but I think it would be important that I don't think it's a case of that you should have some bit of honesty there and explain to them that, oh yeah, they said you're doing well in this and this, and maybe this might need a little bit of work or something along those lines. And I'd always go with a sandwich approach, two positives with one negative in the middle. Don't go in and say your writing's atrocious and your teacher then because that teacher's gone, is presumably maybe next year, maybe not, I don't want to make the assumption, but again, it's a new step, new year um, coming in, and I wouldn't, that's going to leave a really big mark to, in relationship towards school for a three-month period without an ability to refresh. So I would say um, use your um, artistic license in what the teacher has said. They don't need to see what's written exactly on paper, but just explain through and say, yeah, this is what's going on, this is what they thought, but you're a, they're only a teacher. Um, and I can say that is after being a teacher that, um, you know, it's, it's very subjective. It's not, a, no, nothing, nothing we, I ever wrote was a fact. It was a subjective opinion. So that shouldn't impact your child's whole summer either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's really, really sound advice. Um, the struggles and, and maybe perhaps, you know, having a conversation with the teacher, if that is, mm. that same teacher is there. Um, sometimes children get the same teacher for a couple of years just to, perhaps outline to them, you know, how you might, they might be able to work together to increase his confidence and skills in those areas. Just a small piece, actually, as I mentioned that, I would say, if you got, if you feel you got blindsided by that at the end of the year, I'd make sure next year that there's, that you keep in touch. And I'd say, from my personal experience as a teacher, I never mm -hmm. felt the parent was nagging if they just came in and checked in for two minutes a week and just said, how are they getting on? This, this, and this is fine. If you've got blindsided by it, there's probably a lapse in communication somewhere along the lines. Um, and just try and make sure that's an open communication process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, look, I've got a few other questions. I don't think it's it's after 10 past already. We're not really going to get around to them, um, but they're just, there's a couple here in the general areas of social skills and um, being a little bit behind in sports and being a little bit behind their peers of the same age mm. and parents concerned that that might make the child sort of um, damage their confidence or less likely to participate when they can see that they're not at the same level as their friends, particularly in the area of sports. What's your advice there? Um, I suppose the first thing is it's, there's no hard and fast answer to say, yeah, they're not, they're not doing well at sports, so they shouldn't do it. But I think it's a, really, it's a really kind of broad question of saying, how much enjoyment are they getting out of it? How much um, annoyance or negativity are they getting out of it? And what's the benefit of them taking part in activity? That's my first kind of overarching frame I'd put in it. And then you're looking at saying, I'm yet, I'm yet to meet a child with dyspraxia who's not, who's not exceptional at some random talent. 
And I think it's really important that we say, like, I know I, I've lived in the countryside for the majority of my life, and I guess it, I, you might know, so I was a uh, 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 my bonnet about hurling football and um, soccer. I love playing all those, don't get me wrong, but I didn't have an option. And I think it's really important nowadays that there are those different sports that your, your child does not have to be an amazing footballer. But if they're getting a, a ton of medals for swimming or a ton of medals for rugby, um, whatever it is, um, whatever it is their niche, even if it's karate and they're getting their belts, and they have that show and tell to come in and show that their, their peers can see they're succeeding and they might they might even go and do that thing. But it doesn't have to be, I know, and I, and I appreciate too, in so, small communities, it's important to be a part of those things. But after a certain age, they're still going to be their friend regardless if they're going to training or not. Mm, yeah, and that's very important to remember, I think, as well. Look, it's it's uh, it's been a very very interesting topic this evening. This evening, yes, dear Lord, excuse me. <laughs> this evening, Stephen. Um, oh, look, the gremlins have definitely been at work today. We we realised that a lot of parents came along this evening hoping for very specific answers, and I think there's so much information in Stephen's slides, which we will be sending out to everyone. Um, that hopefully you will get some answers from that. Please uh, do get in contact with us if you have any specific queries that you feel weren't answered, or if you have any concerns about your child, that's what we're here for. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you at our next uh, talk next month. And Stephen, thank you so much. Again, you were fantastic. Your knowledge is wonderful. And the fact that you can speak so uh, confidently and professionally across both teaching and occupational therapy is, uh, is a real pleasure for so many of us. So thank you very, very much. Thanks very much.